Okay. So welcome everybody again to this new session of the Simna Seminar course. Uh, today we are pleased to have with us uh, Professor Massimiliano Cremonesi. Uh, Massimiliano is Associate Professor of Solid Mechanics at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering of Politecnico di Milano. And uh, his research interests include numerical simulation of fluid flow for compressible and incompressible applications, fluid structure interaction, the simulation of multi-scale problems with model order reduction techniques and the analysis of solid dissipation in microstructures. Uh, today, he's going to talk us about a fully explicit Laranjan finite analytic method for highly nonlinear fluid structure interaction problems. Okay, Massimiliano, please. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Ignazi, and thanks uh, to you uh, to all the organizers to invite me. I'm very glad to give this seminar to you. And uh, as already introduced by Ignazi, I will talk about uh, a, a work we are doing uh, from some years. And our idea is to develop a fully explicit Lagrangian finite method for uh, fluid structure interaction problems. Uh, this work is done in cooperation with some colleagues of Polytechnic Milano and some in the couple of PhD students who work on that. So first of all, uh, our objective, uh, our objective is a numerical simulation of fluid structure interaction problems, mainly characterized by the presence of free surfaces fluid flow and possibly very large deformation of a fluid domain, but also high nonlinear solid structure behavior in a very fast dynamic frameworks. Typical example can be the burst strike, effect of explosion, underwater explosion, or as we will see later on, the deployment of, the deployment of higher backs. So a possibility to solve uh, free surface fluid flow in a very large deformation domain is the use of Lagrangian approaches which proved to be particularly suited for these kind of problems, both in the case of mesh-free or mesh-based solvers. Typically, when we want to solve a nonlinear problem, an ugly nonlinear problem in a very fast dynamics, fine element method is preferred, in particular with explicit time integration. So typically, fluid and solid domain are characterized by different physics, but also by different time scales. So we would like to develop a technique, a method, with uh, different meshes in the two domains, in the solid and the fluid domains, but also different time step size, or in general, different time integration schemes. That's why we decided to use a partition approach, which allow us to use different mesh in the two uh, domains with non-conforming meshes at the interface, but also different time step size in the fluid and solid domains. But uh, moreover, we would like to solve also very large case problem with possible millions of degrees of freedom. So we would like to exploit the possibility of uh, uh, efficient parallelization, but also thinking uh, from the beginning methods and algorithm that is adapted, is uh, suited for these large scale problems. So the idea is to exploit the possibility of a split solver coupled together explicitly. So the so-called loosely couples approach. This kind of loosely coupled has been proved uh, in the literature by different authors, but uh, among the different possibilities, we de decide to use a partition scheme based uh, on the domain decomposition technique with the idea of the gravity convescue algorithm. This kind of technique ensures strong coupling, but also the stability of the interaction, allow us to use different time step size and non-conforming meshes in the two subdomain. So the key idea of this uh, technique is to solve fluid and solid domain independently, as if there is no interaction between them, then the two distant analysis are re-synchronized by considering a set of constraints at the fluid-solid interface. So this is our general idea, our uh, general idea to develop this uh, efficient solver. To explain all the details of this solver, I will follow this outline. First, I will explain how we solve the fluid problem explicitly with some uh, specific care or specific attention to the 3D case. Then I will very, very quickly explain how we solve the uh, solid domain. And then I will talk in details about the coupling technique. I will show some example of FSI problems. And then at the end, I will also introduce some special treatment of the boundary condition for some specific uh, problem. So first of all, let's concentrate on, on the explicit solution scheme for uh, the fluid problem. First of all, explicit, but also Lagrangian, as I said before. And typically, navier stokes equation for fluid are solved in the Eulerian framework called in ALE. But as most of you uh, already know, in some cases, Lagrangian formulations can be attractive from a computational point of view because it shows some advantages. For example, the most important one for us is the automatic definition of the interfaces between fluid and solid, but also the identification of free surfaces. But there are other uh, motivations that uh, push us to use Lagrangian approach. For example, the lack of convective term in time derivatives and no, the non-necessity of stabilization, but also the fact that the matrices which arise are symmetric. 
and uh, easy to store and uh, faster to solve. There are many other reasons. I don't want to stress too much on that. But as we know, uh, if from the one hand we have some advantages of the Lagrangian formulation, we have also an important drawbacks or important drawbacks. The most important one is the major drawbacks of the Lagrangian approach is due to the fact that particle uh, moves, so mesh node move. So uh, we have to move the uh, particle following the fluid velocity. And if we use a mesh-based solver, we can encounter very high dif distortion of the mesh and leading to possible uh, solution impossible to be followed and also loss of accuracy. Uh, obviously a possibility to use Lagrangian approach uh, to avoid the drawbacks of the mesh-based solver is to use the particle methods, something like meshless or mesh-free methods like SPH or element-free galaxy or something like that. But uh, an interesting possibility is they use a Lagrangian approach with uh, a mesh-based uh, mesh based solver using the so-called particle finite element method, which proposes a Galerkin approach, a Galerkin finite element approach, coupled with a very fast and efficient delonity solution to guarantee high quality of the mesh. So we decide to use this technique. And in particular, we start from the fluid domain. And here we use the, the, the option to model the fluid as weakly compressible. And here we have uh, the equation of motion, which are mass conservation and momentum conservation. Here, rho is the density, V is the velocity field, sigma, as usual, the Cauchy stress tensor, and B represents the body forces. As usual, we can decompose uh, the stress in hydrostatic and uh, deviatoric part, and the deviatoric part of the the deviatoric part of the stress can be related to the deviatoric strength rate, rate through uh, this rheological law, which can be linear or linear according to the use of Newtonian or non-Newtonian fluids. It's important to recall that in the deviatoric strain rate, we have also the divergence of velocity, which is not zero in this case, because we are considering a weakly compressible continuum. To close our problem, is we need also an equation of state, which relate pressure to the density or pressure variations to the density variation. So these are the equation we would like to solve. And uh, starting from this equation, this strong form of the equation, we, profi we proceed with standard Galerkin fundamental approach. So we discretize momentum conservation and mass conservation. And here we have the uh, semi discretized momentum conservation in space, where M is the standard mass matrix. V is the vector containing uh, nodal velocities. And uh, as typically done in uh, explicit time integration techniques, we uh, decompose the right hand side in two parts the so called external forces and internal forces. The external forces contain the term due to boundary conditions and body forces, while the internal forces are the terms related to stresses. Using the same time of discretization, we can also discretize mass conservation. Mass conservation can be written in both form of uh, uh, density equation or pressure equation is exactly the same. Uh, we obtain uh, an equation like the one I have here, where R here in this case contain the uh, unknown density. Okay, this represents the uh, space discretization. We have to move to the time integration. As I said, we would like an explicit scheme, so we decide to use the central difference scheme just because this is second order accurate. So once we have defined the dimension of our time step size, we can first of all update the so-called mid-step velocity, then we can compute the displacements, and then we, have, we can solve the equation to find the acceleration. Once we know the acceleration, we can update the velocity to find the real velocity at the end of the step. This is the standard central difference scheme for the integration in time of, for explicit integration in time of momentum conservation equation. But you have to remember that we need to solve also mass conservation, the question of states, which do not depend on time, but should be enforced at time tm plus one. So we enforce these two equations, mass conservation equation and the equation of state at time tm plus one. An important point is that we decide to solve this equation just after the displacement update, so that we can compute the acceleration using the uh, density and the pressure at time tm plus one. It's important to re remember that this solution scheme is uh, uh, intrinsically uh, instable, is conditionally stable because uh, uh, it's explicit. So uh, the time step should be uh, computed to respect the CFL stability condition. And uh, we use an adaptive time step so that at every time step, we compute the stable time step to be used uh, in the next one. And uh, as it will be important later on, just uh, to remember you that the stable time step size can be computed starting from the typical dimension of an element and the velocity of the sound in the medium. And this will be very important later on. And just last comment before going on, in this solution scheme, if the matrix MF and the matrix M rho are lumped, 
we obtain a fully diagonal system, which can be solved node by node very, very efficiently without solving any linear system. So we obtain a very efficient solution scheme. The price to pay to this efficiency is obviously the uh, conditional stability, which I'll, uh, oblige us to use a, a time step size which should respect the CFL. Okay, and uh, as I said before, to deal with the uh, large deformation, large displacement of our domain, we use the particle finite element method. So the idea is to move the node following the Lagrangian velocity, but when the mesh becomes too distorted, we update the connectivity of our mesh to obtain a new regular mesh. So starting from the nodes of the previous mesh or the initial nodes, we can generate the Deronet isolation, which creates a convex figure which encloses on the point. Then we can recompute the boundary condition to respect the real domain and to impose correctly boundary conditions. Then we can solve our Navier-Stokes equation in this domain, and then following a pure Lagrangian approach, we can update the node's position and repeat for the next time step. So if needed, we can restart again from the domain isolation, compute the new boundary, and solve for the next time step. So this is the standard solution scheme of particle finite element method. I don't want to stress too much on that because uh, I know that most of you are very familiar with that. And uh, an important point is how to define the boundary. So if we start from nodes, we have that the related solution generate a convex figure which encloses all the voids. And uh, using a technique which is motivated from computer graphics called alpha shape, we are able to remove all the unnecessary elements to find the real shape using a criteria which is based on mesh distortion. So what we typically do is to check uh, the, distort the local distortion of an element using a criteria which in, is, in its simpler form can be written here, where we evaluate the ratio between the circumsphere of an element and the typical dimension of the mesh size. If this criteria is not respected, we can remove the element from our, uh, from our set. And what we obtain is something like uh, the example I'm showing here. So we can uh, continuously uh, recover the real boundary to be able to solve these kind of problems. So to conclude the solution of the uh, fluid part, uh, this is a solution scheme we are using for the explicit solution of the fluid domain. So first of all, we have to check the mesh distortion. So if the mesh is too distorted, we have to generate a new one, identify the external boundary, and evaluate the matrices, which depends only on the geometry. Then we have to estimate the stable time step size for each time step, and this is then uh, imposing the respect of the CFL condition. Then we have to compute the mid step velocity and the displacement, and this is done using the standard central difference equation. Then we can solve density and pressure field at time tm plus one, and finally we can solve the, uh, acceleration. And once we know the acceleration, we can update the velocity to find the real velocity at the end of the step. So this is a fully explicit solution scheme, which can be solved very efficiently uh, node by node without uh, the necessity and the need to solve any linear systems. This technique is very efficient and can be applied very easily because it's easy also to implement. And a critical point is that we have to respect the uh, CFL condition in the definition of the time step size. And uh, uh, that's why uh, we'll stress a bit on what we have to do in 3D, because this solution scheme, it uh, works very well in 2D. But because in 2D, we have some guarantees that uh, the lunar tessellation generates very good meshes with very good properties. I don't want to list all the properties of the lunar tessellation in 2D, but the important point is that it generates a very good mesh. And luckily for us, in 3D, this is not happening. And in particular, in 3D, some very bad elements can appear. So in particular, the so-called slivers element can appear. These sliver elements are tetrahedron, which, practically speaking, zero volume, which uh, four points on the same planes. These elements can be uh, uh, can be very bad to treat, in particular because they can uh, reduce the quality of our solution in general. But most important for us that we are using an explicit time uh, integration, this element can reduce drastically the stable time step size. If we have an element with, practically speaking, a zero volume, we can obtain a very, very low value of the stable time step size. And considering that these kind of elements can appear every time we generate a new mesh and we have to generate it frequently, we can obtain very, very low value of time step size, practically speaking, making impossible the solution with an explicit shoulders because time step size become very, very slow and the analysis takes too much time to run. So our idea is that we cannot use uh, this technique without a regularization of the mesh. What does it mean? That we want to introduce a technique which allows us to remove all this bad tetrahedra and 
this technique should be as much as possible inexpensive because we have to appear at this technique many times. As you probably know, there exist uh, a lot of techniques, many techniques in the literature that uh, allow us to regularize the mesh. And, uh, but the point is that standard techniques, standard method optimization algorithms, like for example, Laplace's smoothings, are not suited for PFM because are too expensive, because we need some technique which is very, very fast, which should be, should be applied every time we regenerate a new mesh. So we de decide to develop our own uh, regularization techniques. And uh, the idea is to exploit the, uh, the analogy between a regularization technique and an elastic problem. So we decide to introduce a fictitious pressure, which is very high on the distorted elements, for example, in the sliver element, and very small in regular elements. So we introduce this fictitious pressure, which is very high here in uh, element with uh, bad shapes like slivers, and very small in standard elements. Then we solve a elastic static problem to find the distribution of stresses. And using this distribution of stresses, we compute the displacement of the mesh. And uh, this technique allows us to solve an elastic problem very efficiently. And I have an example here just to understand better what happens in 2D. Let's imagine to have this mesh where we have evidently these two bad elements with this uh, very bad shape. And this simple mesh gives rise to a stable time step size of 5, five uh, 10 to the minus 5. Now, we introduce this fictitious pressure, which is proportional to the shape of our element. So we have very high pressure here and very low all around. And then we apply our algorithm. So what we obtain is that uh, the elastic driven prob the problem of elasticity driven by this pressure uh, increase the, uh, the volume of this element here. And at the end, we can compute a new stable time step type, which is more than one, one order of magnitude larger than the previous one. In 2D is not very important, but as we will see later on in 3D, this can uh, give us uh, significant advantages. But uh, uh, this technique works very well, but to give right to an important problem for us, we have to solve an elastic problem. And an elastostatic problem is intrinsically implicit because we have to solve the linear system. But our idea is to develop a, a, an approach which is fully explicit also in the regularization of the technique, a regularization technique. So our idea is to introduce a fictitious dynamics to convert to the static problem. So we would like to solve a problem which is static, elastostatic, and we decide to solve it dynamically, introducing some parameters uh, which are not physical, but they, these parameters can be computed to speed up as much as possible the convergence to the static solution. So instead of solving a static problem, we solve a dynamic problem which converts to the static solution. But during this, using this idea, we can also use an explicit time integration also for uh, this kind of regularization problem. So that we have, again, a solution which is explicit. But interesting point is that we can use, we can obtain exactly a solution scheme which is equivalent to the solution of the <laughs> momentum conservation equation we have because we are solving the same problem. So you, we can use the same code architecture to uh, solve this kind of equation. And so important point is also very suited to parallelization. This convergence to the static solution is very fast. And interesting point, this technique do not alter the boundary of, of the fluid bulk. So this is a technique which works very well. And uh, the point is that this last point is very important because do not alter uh, the boundary of the bulk, the fluid bulk, but it's ineffective on the T-trader, which is close to the boundaries. So that we need something to improve the quality of uh, uh, boundary T-trader. But before that, let's see, let's try to see if uh, we can see what happens in 3D is exactly the same. We have this bad element, which are uh, let's say, uh, so in which we solve a elastic problem, which uh, increases the volume of these elements. It's hard to see in two, in, uh, here in this example, but we can show that also in this simple patch of elements, we can increase the stable time step size of two order of magnitude. And as I said before, these techniques work, very, techniques work very well, but do not alter uh, the, fluid, uh, the fluid elements at the boundary. Uh, so we decide to apply a technique from the literature, which is uh, called the normal smoothing. And this is due to this uh, author here, this paper, the so-called get me a smoothing, uh, which uh, practically speaking moves uh, the uh, nodes of the Tetrarino in the direction of the normal to the opposite phase. So the idea is that you apply this technique, one Tetrarino at the time, you can improve the quality 
of uh, uh, also tetrahedron which are close to the boundaries. And these techniques uh, uh, work very well, in particular combining the previous one. So we are, our idea is to apply the previous technique, the one which we are which we proposed, and where our technique do not work because it's the, the bed elements are too close to the boundary, we apply also this one. And this technique is very easy to implement. It uh, uh, involves only small movement of the boundary, and uh, it's especially uh, efficient with when combined with the first one. An important point, it's up only one tetrahedron at a time, and uh, it's not parallel, but it's involved a small number of elements. And uh, we have to check that because after this uh, technique, we just uh, modify one element. So we have to check that the surrounding element do not uh, decrease the very quality due to the movement of this one. So it's a technique that should be used with care, but allow us to improve the quality, the general quality. So these two techniques coupled together allow us to solve very large problems, as we will see later on. I have some example here. For example, the standard dam break here. This is the standard 3D dam break uh, solved with um, 750,000 uh, elements, so more than two meters of the of freedom. So here we have the results, and here we compare, as usual, the front time evolution with uh, experimental data with our numerical solution. So our solution is in line with uh, the standard. What is important is this graph here, which show us the stable time step size as a function of time. So every time we compute the new stable time step size. As we will see, the blue line represents the normal stable time step size just after the drone tessellation. And we obtain a stable time step size of 10 to the minus 8 as a mean value. Then if we apply our technique, the elastic analogy, we obtain the orange line. So we have a very significant increase of the stable time step size. And if we couple together the two techniques we are proposing, we obtain the red line. So we obtain a mean value, which is more than two order of magnitude larger than the one obtained with standard of tessellation. So we can increase our stable type, type size of at least two order of magnitude. And this means that we can speed up significantly the solution of our problem. So this can be repeated also for other tests. This is, for example, a number with an obstacle, again, with a quite large number of elements. And here we can compare results in terms of uh, eight of the column of water. Here we have two probes which measure the eight of the water, and this compare the red line represent our numerical result compared with experimental data or with other uh, numerical results. And also we measure the pressure on the obstacle here, and we obtain a very good agreement. But interesting could serve also the uh, time step size. So here we have we separate in three graphs the same information we had before. So here we have the stable time step size after the latest oscillation. So we have a minimum value in some point of 10 to the minus 10 and the mean value of 10 to the minus 8. After our regularization technique, we increase the mean value to 10 to the minus 6 and the minimum of 10 to the minus 8. And finally, applying the Two techniques together, we again increase a bit the mean value to the again to 10 to the minus 6, but also the minimum value is 10 to the minus 7. So we increase the mean value of two order of magnitude, more than two order of magnitude, and the minimum value of more than three order of magnitude. So we have a significant increase of a stable time step size, which means a very a faster solution to obtain. Same consideration can be repeated also for other tests. For example, here we have uh, an idle planning uh, uh, simulation. So we have a tire which rotate on uh, a, a fluid uh, bed, a water bed. And also in this case, we have very same consideration we had before. I don't want to recommend again this uh, graph because it's exactly the same we had before. So that we uh, develop a technique which works very well in these uh, fluid cases. So we are able to solve efficiently with uh, a technique uh, which is fully explicit. Uh, the fluid part of the problem. The interesting part is that this technique is very easy to parallelize because we, had, we did not store and invert any matrices. So all the computations are explicit. So uh, oh, I have a last example here about uh, non-Newtonian fluid, but same consideration holds also for non-Newtonian fluids. This is an example of casting. But uh, let's go to the next step. And uh, as I said, we would like to solve fluid structure interaction. So the next step is how we solve the solid or the structure. And the idea is to use standard finite element for a solid domain. 
So start the final element means that we have to solve momentum conservation or if needed, also mass conservation. We apply also in this case, finite element discretization. And also in this case, we use a, um, explicit time integration. We choose explicit, uh, explicit time integration based on several different schemes because it's second order accurate, but you can imagine to use different integration schemes in the two subdomain, the fluid one and the solid one. I don't want to repeat the steps of the uh, central different scheme because are exactly the same as in the fluid one. Some important comments on the solid domain. Uh, we can use structural element, for example, beams or shell or solid elements. We can use different constitutive law, nonlinear elasticity, plasticity, because uh, using a, a partitioned approach, the solution of the two subdomain uh, is independent. And then the example we will show later on, we couple our, our fluid solver with a commercial software for the solid part, which in particular is Abacus Explicit. So we develop a, a coupling technique to couple uh, this structural solver with our fluid solver. So I, I don't want to enter too, in too much of the details of the solid domain because, because these are standard fine elements. But so let's go to the uh, interesting part, which is the uh, FSI algorithm, the interaction between fluid and solids. So the idea is to use the so-called gravity combustion, which is a technique which takes in its root from in the domain decomposition approach. And as I said at the beginning, the important part for us is that which allow us to different time integration steps in the two domains, but also non-conforming meshes at the interface. What is the key idea behind this technique is to split the kinematic solution of each domain in two terms, the so-called free solution and the link solution. The free solution represents the free motion of each subdomain as if there is no interaction between them. So we solve the fluid problem and the solid problem as if there is no interaction between them. Then we have to solve the link solution, which evaluate the correction to the first one, applying some boundary traction, which prohibits the role of the Lagrange multipliers to enforce a kinematic constraint at the fluid solid interface. So the idea is to first solve the two problems independently, then go to the interface, solve the problem at the interface, which correct the first solution. But looking at the details, here we have the weak form of momentum conservation for the fluid and for the solid, where we have to add to this weak form a term, which is a standard Lagrange multiplier term, which enforces the continuity of a kinematic variable W at the fluid solid interface. So we have this term defined at the fluid solid interface, which represents a constraint at the fluid solid interface, where we have to enforce that this kinematic constraint, this kinematic variable is equal from the fluid and solid part. This kinematic constraint, this kinematic variable can be, for example, velocity, acceleration, or displacement. So the techniques works enforcing the continuity of one of these three variables. We decide to use uh, velocity. We can proceed with standard finite elements, so we can also discretize the Lagrange multiplier with finite elements. So we obtain a continuity equation at the interface, which can be written in this form here, which enforces weakly the continuity at the interfaces between fluid and solid. So, Practically speaking, our algorithm works in this form. First of all, solve the two free problems. So solve the fluid problem and the solid problem as if there is no interaction between them. Then go at the interface, ensemble this operator H, which is a sort of tickle poincare operator at the interface. And with once you solve this, or you compute this operator, you can solve the interface problem, this one, which allow us to compute the Lagrange multiplier. Once we know the Lagrange multiplier, we can solve the link problem here. Once again, the link problem is solved on the fluid and the solid domain independently. And the link problem, we evaluate the correction to be applied to the first problem to obtain uh, the continuity of the kinematic interface the, uh, and the kinematic variable at the interface. So this is a predictor correct algorithm, which first predicts a solution and then correct the solution to restore the compatibility at the interface. Uh, some comment on this uh, uh, algorithm. In this solution scheme, it's important the interface problem. And in the interface problem, we have this operator H, and in particular, this matrices C. If we use conforming meshes, this operator C are Boolean matrices, which, practically speaking, extract only the value of the variable at the interface. So if we are conforming meshes, these are very easy to compute. In case of non-conforming meshes, this operator contains extrapolation or interpolation function, which allow us to compute the quantity at the interface. So matrix C depends on the shape function of the two sides. But in the case of conforming meshes, this matrix C are Boolean and give rise to an operator H, which is square and diagonal. 
So it's very fast to be solved. And in particular, it's, again, explicit because it can be solved without solving a linear system. So if we have conforming meshing, we have this operator, which is diagonal. So we obtain a very full explicit solver because we have two problems here which are explicit. This problem here is explicit. And also the correction is explicit. So we can solve the fully FSI problem without inverting or solving any linear system. On the contrary, if we have non-conforming meshes at the interface, operator H is not diagonal. But, and so we have to solve the linear system at the interface. But it's important to observe that it, this linear system at the interface has a small dimension because it has the dimension of the interface and not of the global problem. So if we, we want to use non-conforming mesh, we have to solve an interface problem, but the uh, linear system to be solved is very small compared to the global dimension of the problem. So this is the solution scheme we are using to solve uh, FSI. A very important point is that we are using explicit solver in two, two subdomains. But for us, it's very important to guarantee the stability of the two subdomains. And it's important to be able to use different types of size in the two subdomains because uh, we cannot uh, decrease uh, the velocity of one solder to weight the other one, which has, a, for example, a stable time step size which is smaller. So we want to use independent types of size in the two subdomains. And these techniques allow us also to use different uh, domain, different discretization of the uh, of the um, time. We can have a, a coarse domain time for one for one uh, for domain, for example, the solid of the fluid, and a finer domain for the other, the solid of the fluid. The idea is that the important point, we can use these techniques, we can use this subcycling technique, but the important point is that we have to enforce the continuity and uh, the solution of the um, variable, the, the uh, equation at the interface at the finer time scales. Once we allow, in, ensure the solution at the fine, that, that finer time scale, we ensure the, the stability of this uh, robustness of this solution scale. So with that, we have all that we need to solve our FSI problem in a fully explicit, in case of uh, conforming mesh technique. So let's see some example. First of all, I want to show a 2D example. It's an example taken uh, uh, from this paper here, where you have uh, a container which is filled in with a viscous material, which uh, fall down with, in this funnel-shaped container, fall down and uh, fill this uh, container with this elastic and clamp it at these extremities here. This is interesting because uh, the, uh, the container is very deformable. And here we have the results and the comparison with uh, the paper I showed you before. Here in this graph, we can observe the dynamics and the comparison, which is quite good in terms of displacement in here in the bottom of the container. We did two tests, one uh, uh, with different value of the fluids, and in both cases, we have a good agreement with, uh, with the result of the literature. And this is example 2D. I have many examples in 2D, but I don't want to show too much uh, example. Let's move to 3D example. This is the very well-known FSI test of dam break with an elastic obstacle. So we have, we have the, the dam break, which collide with elastic obstacle. And here we can compare the results in terms of displacement at the top of this plate here with uh, other results of the literature, the dots. And uh, no, sorry, I've, see, uh, yes, other results of the literature. And uh, as we did before, we can also compare, uh, check again uh, the stability of our solution and uh, how, how the regularization techniques works in case of FSI. And this is the graph I showed you before about the stable time step size just after the redesolation. And this is the same graph just after uh, our smoothing technique. And we can see, also in this case, we can gain three order of magnitude in the minimum value and two order of magnitude in the mean value. We have again a second test, which is an opening of an elastic gate. Uh, this is again a very well-known test where we have a column of water, which kept, it, which kept on the right side of uh, our domain by two wall, a first wall, which is rigid, and the second wall, which is divided in two parts, an upper rigid part and the second elastic gate, which is clamped here and free to move here. The interesting part is this uh, test is that we have experimental data on the elastic material on, which form the elastic gate. And this is uh, this material is a moon living uh, material. And uh, instead of defining directly the constitutive law of this material, we define the constitutive law through this data here directly. So here we have some results in 2D. OK, but we, let's look at directly a bit 3D results here. Again, we can compare the result of experimental data. The dot and the triangles represents uh, experimental data in terms of 
horizontal displacement and vertical displacement, and the continuous dry represent our results both in 2D and 3D. And so we have a good agreement also in this case. And again, we can check how our regularization technique here to, uh, to see if also in FSI case works correctly. And we can say that, yes, it's all correctly because we gain order of magnitude also in this case. Okay, and uh, before going to my last examples, uh, I want to talk very briefly about uh, a special treatment we introduced to our boundary condition. We will see later on how, why we need this uh, ingredients in our solvers, but the important point is that in PFAN framework uh, or in standard Lagrangian approaches uh, for fluid flow, we impose boundary condition on nodes, or in some case we can call ghost nodes, the nodes where we are imposing boundary conditions. Uh, but in fluid mechanics, typically we have two different type of boundary conditions. Some that we can call real boundaries, so the free surfaces, the walls, or some which call fictitious boundaries, so boundaries which are not physical, but in some cases are useful. For example, in flow outflow condition, condition, symmetry condition, which allow us to reduce the size of our problems. And some, case, some of these boundary conditions are easy to impose in our PFM framework, for example, free surfaces or boundary nodes, but some others, and here there's an error, we should be with sleep because this is not sleep two times, sorry, this is sleep. And uh, when we want to impose sleeps, or in flow and outflow, or again, symmetry, we can have problems. And the, the reason can be understood looking uh, at this uh, problem here. For example, if we have an inflow in a Lagrangian framework, like PFM, when, impose, when we impose the velocity of, B, of this boundary, this boundary node moves. So at the next time step, we don't have a mesh again here to impose the boundary condition because our mesh nodes have been moved. There, have been presented many different solutions in the framework of PFAN to those uh, problems. Uh, we decide to use our idea, which is to use uh, uh, to impose non-homogeneous boundary condition in PFAN. We use standard Lagrangian approach everywhere, but on some boundaries we impose we impose some nodes to be Eulerian. So we fix some node, we impose Eulerian nodes at some boundary where we want to impose boundary condition, and all the rest of our domain will be Lagrangian. And uh, if we all, we, you want, you can formulate all uh, the governing equation using the a, a, a LE framework where uh, we have the velocity of the convective velocity, which is uh, equal to the velocity of the fluid in case of Eulerian framework and equal to zero in the case of Lagrangian framework. So we can repeat and uh, introduce everything. We can discretize again using uh, um, explicit time integration. Again, nothing is changing. The only things we have to take care of are these elements, which are, have some nodes which are Eulerian and some nodes which can be Lagrangian. Also in this element, you also have to uh, compute the convective term, the stabilization of this convective term, but this can be done at, in standard fluid mechanics. And we did some tests, for example, some standard tests with, for example, wet flow and Poiseuille flow with slip. Uh, here we have the result of wet flow and Poiseuille flow compared with analytical solution, which can be computed, for example, from both these two. And the black, uh, the continuous line represents our numerical results, while the square dots, the points, represent numerical uh, anal analytical solution, both for wet flow and Poiseuille flow. And we verify that we have a very good, perfect agreement with between our uh, solver and this and this two solution two analytical solution in particular in also in definition of the boundary condition which in this case are not standard with the pfm solver but we can solve other problem which are not typical uh, solved with lagrangian approach like for example the quet flow here we have the solution of the quet flow so we have all the domain which is lagrangian on the, the line of nodes which belong here to the top of the cavity, uh, which where we impose a fixed velocity, which is our Eulerian. So we are able to obtain the classical solution of the cavity flow, which can be compared with uh, uh, the very well-known year solution for the cavity. Or we can solve inflow outflow problem like this one, where here we have a set of uh, uh, nodes which are Eulerian, where we impose boundary conditions, and the rest of the domain is Lagrangian as usual. So, this works for fluid, but can be also applied to FSI to FSI problem. For example, this is again a very well known benchmark of FSI proposed by Turek and Horn, uh, where we have a fluid in this container with an inflow fixed here, and we have this 
circle which is rigid and this this is a beam which is free to uh, oscillate in uh, uh, in time in the in the fluid domain so here we have the results of one of the two of the three tests proposed by Turek and Horn and here we can compare the results in terms of frequency and amplitude uh, for both FSI 1, FSI 2 and FSI 3 and for example FSI 3 is a case where we have a large added mass effect and we discover that our solver works without any problem also in these cases. Okay, um, uh, this, all these ingredients I introduced up to now allow us to solve very efficiently an FSI problem uh, with the uh, a full Lagrangian approach and full explicit. And uh, our main application is a problem which needs all the ingredients I present up to now, because we would like to solve the uh, deployment of a flat airbag. So the idea is to uh, study the opening of an airbag. In particular, our geometry would be this geometry, uh, this, this, this quite simple geometry where we have uh, this airbag, which is uh, empty. And here, this region here, where well, we impose an inflow and we want to see how this airbag inflates. And uh, we consider the uh, gas the gas as a light in vicious air-like fluid. And we have this mass flow rate, which is uh, imposed here at this uh, inflow region. And the interesting part that we are able also to use a specific constitutive law, which is developed ad hoc for airbags, which account for uh, the behavior of uh, the structural behavior of uh, the airbag which is a, um, a, a structure which is very uh, specific, uh, defined for this kind of uh, uh, structural materials. So here we have some examples. Uh, the first one is the feeling of the airbag. Here we can look at the fluid inside the, the domain. And here we have the structural outputs. Okay, sorry see again what happens and the interesting part is that we have some experimental data available to uh, some test that which is used to test this kind of elements in particular uh, to test this kind of element a mass of um, a spherical mass is placed on the top of the airbag and the, uh, the acceleration of the mass is measured uh, we repeat the, our test uh, placing this mass on the top of the airbag And uh, we can see that the mash is pushed up by the opening of the airbag. And then we can measure the acceleration of this mass here. And in particular, we have here some uh, pictures synchronized between uh, our results and experimental data. And here we can compare the results in terms of acceleration of the mass. Sorry for this very, this is a typo. This acceleration is meter over uh, square second, sorry. And here we have uh, the red line, which is our numerical result, which is compared with the black line, which represents experimental data. So we obtain a result which is very much in agreement with this uh, uh, experimental data. So this example contains all the ingredients I show you up to now. So we need a very efficient solver for the fluid, which is explicit, a very efficient solver for the solid, again explicit, and uh, a, coupling, a coupling between fluid and solid, which is done with the domain decomposition algorithm I showed you before, which is, again, explicit for the case of non-conforming meshes. We need also the technique to introduce a, a special treatment boundary condition because we have to consider the inflow of the airbag. It's important to record that here we use a lot also our regularization technique because the mesh is regenerated many times. So this is a very large example and uh, <clears throat> we solved very recently, but we are using the technique also to solve not so large example, but interesting one. For example, uh, we are doing a lot of work in the study of uh, uh, the interaction between soil and pipeline, because uh, typically uh, submarine pipelines interact with shallow soil layer, which typically are prone to liquefaction as a consequence of poor pressure built up. This can be due to earthquake uh, structural vibration and so on. But when liquefaction is triggered, the soil tends to behave like a fluid or fluid-like material and uh, it's unable to constrain the pipe and the pipe move up so the pipe can experience some vertical floating or sinking in some cases so we try to study this problem with our approach the only thing that we have to modify is that instead of considering non-newtonian fluid standard non-newtonian fluid 
uh, like a Bingham one, we modify the parameter of non-Newtonian fluid, introducing a dependency of pore pressure. And we solve the equation of pore pressure with the effective stars theory, and we modify our uh, Bingham parameter, considering also the effect of pore pressure. Here we have some results. For example, this is a test we perform. This is a um, test performed by this water where we have a container with a pipe. And here in this large container, the liquefaction is reduced, and this pipe is fixed here, and uh, due to liquefaction, move upwards. And here we have three different tests according to different typical dimension of the pipe. And the uh, um, dots represent experimental data, while the um, continuous line represent our numerical results. So in this uh, problem, which can be quite complex because we are considering uh, also the interaction between uh, <coughs> we are considering fluid structure interaction, but also in present also uh, a reconsolidation effect of the sand, we are obtaining a, a quite good agreement with experimental data. And also a very similar test, instead of considering uh, um, a pipeline which can go up and down, in this case we enforce the motion of the pipe and we measure the drag forces. Uh, this is again a test taken in the literature, and uh, if this is done again in a, a extremely loose uh, saturated sand, uh, and we move this uh, cylinder here, and what we compare is the uh, drag force. Again, here we have the experimental data, which is the uh, dashed line, which is compared with our numerical result, which is the continuous line. Also, in this case, we have a very good agreement. So this is an ongoing work. We are still working on that direction because it's a very interesting problematic work, but I want to show you some preliminary results. And again, I want also to show some very preliminary results also to another application in which we are using the very same framework. So we are studying, changing completely the scales. Here we are going to the micro scales. We are studying the uh, dissipation of the micro mirrors. Uh, micro mirrors are um, uh, very small devices, uh, the typical dimension of less than one millimeters, which are used to sense or to project in micro projectors, for example. And our um, some partners <coughs> ask us to help in the um, definition of the dissipation, the fluid dissipation in air due to this uh, continuous movement. Here we can set our simulation with the device, which is uh, exactly the one is presented here. And then we can compare the torque measured on this device with the angle. Again, in this case, we have a very good agreement because we are comparing the numerical result, which is the blue line in terms of torque, with the experimental data, which is the uh, uh, red line. So also in this case, we have a very good agreement. But again, this is an ongoing work because we are moving to more complex micro mirrors, <coughs> like the one I have here, which uh, move faster. And um, again, we are trying to compare the results in terms of uh, torque and dissipation obtained these kinds of elements. Also, in this case, we need all the ingredients I introduced before because we have an FSI problem in this geometry, which is uh, not exactly the real geometry. So we have considered also probably symmetry. And uh, at the upper bound here is not the physical bound. So we have to consider some condition to account for the rest of the domain. Okay, and the very, very last uh, application we are still working, this is again an ongoing work, is the possibility to study with the same procedure, fluid structure fractured. So here we have two examples, it's still in 2D, but we are still working on that, where uh, we have some uh, solid domain, which is broken by the presence of the uh, fluid or the interaction with the fluids. So again, this is a very, very new work. Uh, we have a PhD student who is working on that at, uh, it's, uh, a promising, uh, promising topic for our fully explicit approach. So I think my time is gone. So I conclude. Uh, in this work, I present the Lagrangian approach explicit to solve FSI problem in the presence of free surface interfaces. I use an explicit p fan for the fluid part and a standard fan for the solid part. I propose a domain decomposition technique for the interaction. This technique can be considered as a predictable correct algorithm, which ensures strong coupling of the partition approach. We can use different types of size in the two subdomain, but also um, non-conforming meshes at the interface. I present this framework for explicit explicit coupling, but the same technique can be also for used for explicit implicit coupling or implicit implicit. I'll present some special treatment boundary condition to allow for real engineering problem, which can be difficult <coughs> to treat with Lagrangian framework. And finally, I present also some uh, special requirement uh, to special treatment of the mesh to regularize the, uh, our uh, 
a mesh for Lagrangian solution with an explicit solver. And uh, we are still working on that. In particular, we would like to speed up as much as possible our calculation to be able to solve problem um, larger and larger, to be able to solve real engineering problem, I, as I show you at the end of my presentation. Uh, we would like to cap with, couple with other physics. We already did some coupling with compressible flow. Uh, I am very much interested in hydro magneto hydrodynamics and many other things. And something which uh, I would like to do from many, many times is the phase transition. So the transition between fluid and solids and vice versa. So uh, with that, I thank you all for your attention. This is uh, the reference of what I said today is uh, contained in these papers here, which represent the, our work in this direction over the last years. So if you need some more details, you can find here, or obviously feel free to contact me in any times to, to discuss on what I'm presenting. So thank you very much uh, to attend and uh, I'm, Glad to answer any question if there are. Thank you very much, Massimiliano. It was a very nice talk. Um, you fit the time perfectly. So we have time maybe for a couple of short questions. If anybody wants to ask. Okay, Alejandro, go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, I hope you can hear me. It's yes, really please. nice to 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 meet you, uh, Professor Gemonesi, because I've been following your work and in my in my thesis. I, I reproduce a lot of cases that you've shown here, so it's re really nice. Um, my question is about the, the your last part of the presentation in yeah. which you are coupling with fracture in the solid, which is what I did in, in my thesis with another approach, but also using the PFM, but our implicit PFM, the one that, yeah. that Alessandro is using. And I'm wondering, how do you break the material? I mean, do you disconnect the connectivities or or how do you handle that? Well, uh, just just to be just to be just to be clear, this is a very very <coughs> uh, starting work in the sense that we just started to work in that direction, and we are very much interested in uh, in this work because uh, we see many potential future applications in that. Up to now, we are simply di disconnecting elements one once some criterion has been. Uh, uh, reached, for example, the maximum stress or um, the maximum strain according to uh, different uh, fracture theory you want to respond. But up to now, we are just uh, uh, um, deconnecting element when we overtake, overpass, overtake some criterion. It's the simpler possible idea we are we are doing right now. Uh, we are still working on that. It's just a very preliminary work. No, no, definitely. No, it, it, as, a, as a first attempt, it's, it's the better thing to do because um, yeah, it's really simple and you can see fancy results, no? Yeah, that's then, the point. We, we would like to start to see something, then uh, we can think to something more, let's say, more uh, connected to the standard fracture mm -hmm. mechanics. Something more energetically suitable, let's say. Yeah, and, and since you're using like a standard uh, solid mechanics solver for the solid part, I suppose, yes. Um, yes. then in order to take into account maybe the potential contact between different blocks, you also plan to, to do it, uh, I mean, some with a penalty method or something? Uh, we, we already did. Uh, uh, I have some example with fluid structure, fracture of two different parts, <coughs> uh, two different places which can come in contact one with each other. Uh, we did with standard penalty contact. Okay, okay. Uh, I was thinking. Okay, so thank you very much. Really interesting. You're welcome. And thank you also to Ignacio. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. Is there any other short question? Miguel Angel? Yeah, go ahead. Um, hi, very hi, interesting hi. presentation. Hi, Mr. Thank Emiliano. You. Thank you. Uh, I had a question regarding the um, operations you do in order to improve the mesh. Yeah. Um, you, I think you didn't go much into details, but yes. I guess there are two possibilities. Either you relocate the nodes with the same information or you interpolate the, the information that was in the place where you are putting the nodes. Yeah. In any case, you have a change in the results. Yes. Um, did you explore the trade-off in terms of uh, loss of accuracy in or, or, or gain? I mean... Yes, we check. Uh, uh, just to respond, to answer to the, the question, we we use the second technique you mentioned, so we move the uh, we move the node in a new position and we reinterpol variables <coughs> in B with the correct value according to uh, the previous one. So we do interpolation in this case. But important point that uh, one I have no time I have no time to show all the details. But these uh, techniques uh, 
uh, is related only to a very few elements. So less than two or three percent of the total elements of the mesh. All the other mesh elements of the mesh uh, are generated as from standard element isolation and are not moved. Here we move just a few elements and uh, we have some local perturbation of the solution. We check it, but uh, we see that we don't have perturbation in terms of energy, in terms of dissipation. So we obtain a solution which is quite good, but I think it's good because we move only a few elements. Okay, so, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any other question or comments? If not, uh, we can close the seminar here. Thank you again, Massimiliano, for your presentation. And uh, thank you all for attending to this last seminar of the year. I hope to see you all next year with more seminars. Thank you again, Massimiliano. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.